Hi everyone, happy Friday uh, or Saturday, depending on where you are. Um, welcome to today's session on artificial intelligence and machine learning for the QA industry as part of the Better Data for Better App series hosted by Hudspin and Women in Big Data. My name is Sharon here at Hudspin, and I just want to thank you all for joining us here today. Um, pretty soon I'll be introducing Shuchi Rana from Hudspin and Women in Big Data and our expert speaker, Jonathan Lips. But first, for those who are new to Hudspin, I want to start with a quick intro on who we are and what we do. Hudspin is the world's first digital experience AI platform that combines cloud-hosted and on-prem global device infrastructure, test automation, and ML-driven performance and quality of experience analytics for mobile, web, audio, and video. Hudspin empowers engineering, QA, operations, and product teams to assure optimal digital experiences across delivery channels throughout the development life cycle. Um, and with that, I'll be handing things over to Shuji. Thanks, Sharon. Let me share my screen real quick. If you can confirm, you can you see it? Yep, looks great. Awesome, great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Shu Chi, and I'm one of the co-directors for the Silicon Valley chapter for um, Women in Big Data. I am also a part of Hetspin. I'm excited to have my colleague, um, Jonathan, talk about an important topic today. So just a few housekeeping rules. If you are not speaking, make sure um, keep yourself muted. And we'll have the Q&A at the end of the presentation. We will also follow up with a blog and uh, the video to the link will be posted on our website in about a week or so. Um, who are we? Our mission is to champion the success of um, women in big data careers, which includes uh, data engineers, data scientists, data virtualization engineers, marketing, sales and business roles through training both technical and business skills. And we enable a lot of industry and peer-to-peer -peer learning through our events. I would say we host an average of about um, four to eight events every month. Um, we were small. We've been around for about five years and um, we've grown from, I would say 15 people to now almost about 17,000 um, women on six different continents. So we're excited and I'm super excited to be a part of this organization. These are some of our key partners that power a lot of our learning. And um, today's session, as Sharon mentioned, is on AI and ML for the QA industry. And my colleague, Jonathan, um, will be taking over uh, shortly. So thank you again for joining us. And a little about Jonathan. Jonathan um, has, uh, been a part of, he's been a developer, all, I guess, an entrepreneurial software developer by career, with an academic background in philosophy, linguistics, and theology. And he is the project lead maintainer and one of the architects for Appium, which um, I'm sure a lot of you know, is an open source um, uh, test automation framework. He is also the director for learning and education programs at Hetspin. And um, I'm super excited to um, hear Jonathan speak today. And when he's not doing all those things, you can find him writing on philosophy of technology and making music. So thank you, Jonathan, for being here. You can find Jonathan online um, on LinkedIn or Twitter. And um, you can find us. Um, uh, there's different ways to engage with us. You can, of course, join the organization, be a member, you can volunteer, partner, or be a sponsor. There's a lot of content available online, so feel free to look us up um, on our website, join the LinkedIn group, um, Facebook group. We also have a private LinkedIn group called Women in Big Data. So that's a great way to engage with the community and um, follow us on Instagram. And all the content, all the videos um, from our experts are also can also be found on our YouTube channel. So feel free to subscribe. With that, I am, thank you again for joining us. I'm going to hand it uh, back to Sharon and I'm gonna stop sharing. All righty, over to you, Sharon. Um, I think we can go, go ahead and get started. 
um, with the presentation. If cool. All right. that, Jonathan. Well, let's do that. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks a lot, Chu Chi, for uh, introducing me, and thanks, Sharon, for introducing Headspin and, and hosting uh, this webinar. I'm really excited to talk to everyone here today. And um, I'll go ahead and share my screen now so we can get going with uh, some slides that I've prepared here. Great. So yeah, as, uh, as Shuchi mentioned, um, I think this is a pretty interesting topic that kind of marries two things that I'm you know, fairly interested in. Um, been working in, in what we call the QA industry for some time now. Um, took a bit of a different path to get into it than, than most, been working on essentially uh, software tools for the QA industry. And um, obviously, I think we're all quite curious about artificial intelligence, machine learning, the kind of uh, promise it holds for various, um, various industries. And uh, we might not have thought, you know, depending on where you come from, might not have thought about what some of the applications of machine learning are for the QA industry. Um, and kind of the focus on this talk will be to um, give a little bit of an, of an introduction to the way I think about AI and machine learning, which you know, might, be, uh, might be quite basic for some of you who uh, you know, may have gone even much deeper into that uh, understanding that field than, than I have. But uh, since I, I'm not assuming we're all coming from the same place, we'll give a little introduction to AI and machine learning so that we can take a look at what some, uh, some of the products that have been marketed to the QA industry about AI and machine learning have been. And uh, from perspective of, of knowledge of machine learning, try and evaluate that to say what is what sort of myth or marketing fluff versus what are some, I think, real interesting applications of of these tools and processes to the QA industry. And of course, we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, Shuchi already introduced me, so I don't think I need to spend more time doing that, apart from saying that um, the kind of three main things that I'm working on right now from a, from a technical and business perspective are this tool called Appium, which facilitates the automation of, uh, of applications, basically. Um, it, it gives developers or QA engineers the ability to write automated uh, steps for any kind of application, uh, which is a key um, component of the process of automated testing of applications. And at Headspin, I'm in charge of something called Headspin University, uh, where our mission is to provide great learning content for uh, the, the QA industry and related industries. So I'll share a little bit about um, kind of our first big course that we launched towards the end of this presentation. And I also spend a lot of time writing uh, kind of free newsletters and, and blogs about Appium and mobile app automation and things like that at a website called Appium Pro, um, which you can also check out if you're curious about that world of mobile test automation. So um, let's first just quickly define a few of the uh, interesting things about the QA industry, because also many of you might be coming from um, other parts of the software development world and might not uh, have thought too much about what QA for software looks like. Just very briefly, uh, if we think about the software development cycle as consisting of you know, basically these different stages, uh, obviously you can get a lot more detailed with um, trying to draw diagrams of the software development cycle, but at the very least, we have stages that include, you know, coming up with ideas, things to build with software, products, or tools, whatever. Uh, there's obviously a stage of actually building things out. And there's a stage of testing the things that you built before you ship them to your users uh, to make sure that they're actually going to work the way you intend. Then there's a phase of releasing the application, which obviously in the, the old days would have been a long phase of pressing you know, CDs or writing floppy disks and mailing them to people and now involves uh, pushing new code to a website or pushing new code to an app store for review, things like that. And then we have a stage of, of figuring out whether the thing we built is actually doing what we intended. And this turns into a kind of spiral of, of product development where you're improving uh, product and coming up with new things to build based on uh, how things went with your last iteration. So 
when I talk about the QA industry and, and the responsibilities that the QA industry has in terms of the software development cycle, we're mostly talking about this stage here, the stage of testing the applications. That's traditionally what we think of when we talk about quality assurance or quality control. It's just making sure that things that don't work don't, don't get in the hands of users uh, to give them bad experiences. Um, in, a, in a very modern software development team, the role and, and responsibilities of QA folks is going to be much broader than simply receiving a, an app build and testing it to make sure it works. And it will you know, probably span into all of these other uh, stages as well. But the kind of very simplistic way of thinking about it is that the testing stage of the cycle is kind of owned by uh, a, a QA team or uh, someone on a team who's thinking about things from the perspective of, of the quality of the application. So the, the two kind of main types of QA that we find uh, out there nowadays are uh, what we call, what we now call manual QA, which is the way that things always used to be tested, uh, which is just essentially hiring people to uh, take new versions of an app that are beta versions or pre-release versions one way or the other, and just use use that application the way they would if they were a, a user um, receiving the application as an official release, and then walking through a variety of predetermined user flows or creatively exploring the app, looking for things that don't appear to work right. So that's what we call manual QA. And it was the kind of traditional form of QA uh, for some time. Um, and then eventually there was enough pressure for uh, increasing the speed and efficiency of the software development cycle that we had to find new new methods for checking the quality of our applications. Uh, and so what, what's become kind of the standard practice for checking the quality of an application nowadays is what we would call automated testing or automated QA that involves actually writing code uh, to test the code that is running in your application. So this can take place at a lot of different levels um, if you have a software development background, uh, you've, you've certainly written unit tests in the past that, that act at the level of individual code units. Um, but we can write automated tests at basically any level you can think of, including sort of the, the highest level out from the application, um, meaning the UI of the application itself. So we can actually write automated tests that completely mimic the way that a user would use an app, uh, finding elements and tapping on buttons as if there were a, a person sitting outside of the application using their, their eyes and their brain to, to navigate through the various screens of, of an app. So these are the two types of QA. Um, everything that we're talking about today basically goes in the bucket of automated QA. That's where the, the industry is at. Um, I develop tools for the purpose of facilitating automated QA. And when people are talking about applying AI and machine learning to the QA industry, they're usually talking about um, processes and, and machine learning methods that assist with automated QA or maybe even replace automated QA. Um, but when it comes to AI and machine learning, no one is really uh, kind of applying that to the manual QA mode, which is necessarily becoming a little bit more obsolete due to the requirements of of speed and efficiency and scale in the software development cycle that, that we now have. So um, what is the question that we're really talking about today when it comes to AI and machine learning in the QA industry? Um, I, think, I think this picture is a good illustration of the question that I want to ask, uh, you know, if, if I were in front of you all in a, in a live room somewhere, I have removed this logo from uh, the picture and asked anybody what they think this is, um, because at first glance, it's a little bit hard to tell that this is a toothbrush uh, that is being promoted as involving artificial intelligence somehow. <laughs> um, when I first saw this image, I think I laughed out loud and said a big nope, um, because the last thing I think I want inside of my teeth is artificial intelligence, but maybe that's, maybe I'm alone in that. Clearly the manufacturers of this particular toothbrush think that they're selling people something that they want. Um, a little bit unclear to me what that is, but this is, I think a kind of example of, uh, how 
maybe even just in marketing, but how in general, I think we can go a little bit overboard in thinking about how AI is, is applied to actual problems that we want to solve. Um, so a natural question is, you know, applied to any given industry, you know, is, is, AI, is AI actually equivalent to BS for that particular industry? You know, it seems like for the toothbrush industry, it's, it's unclear what it means when people say that AI is actually applied to that particular problem of brushing teeth. Um, people have written about this. I found a quote that I really like. Um, it says the, it's talking about something that, that the author calls a BS industrial complex. Um, and I'll, I'll leave you a moment to kind of work out what that might mean based on this quote. But uh, the quote is the core feature of this BS industrial complex is that every member of the ecosystem knows about the charade, but is incentivized to keep shoveling. Uh, and shoveling what, you might ask? Well, the, the BS, obviously. So I think the idea going back to this um, picture is that I think everybody who sees this marketing and everybody involved in creating this bit of marketing knows that what we mean by artificial intelligence here is, you know, a little bit, a little bit fake. Um, but once we've started using terms like AI to refer to basically anything that we want, um, it becomes a kind of table stakes for marketing. And so now it's like, if you don't have AI in your product, uh, you're somehow late to the game or, or not at the table. So you have to say that your product involves AI, whether it really does or not. And at the same time, all, all customers uh, and recipients of this marketing know that, you know, yeah, they're saying they have AI, but that may or may not mean anything. So that's what this quote, I think, gets at that everyone knows about the charade but is incentivized to keep shoveling because if you don't, if you don't sprinkle some AI on whatever it is you have, uh, then you're kind of left in the dust from a marketing perspective. Another image set of images that you've probably seen when it comes to AI is, is this one. Um, the idea behind this meme is that a lot of what people promote as AI, um, is really just, kind of software development under the hood. You know, it's not actually anything different than what we've had for years in coming up with algorithmic solutions to, to problems. So uh, hand, hand coded uh, solutions to problems that simply use, you know, regular old software development practices. Um, so in this case, they're just saying there's a bunch of, bunch of if else statements that lead from a problem to a solution. And so people, and I make fun of unmasking different um, bits of software that are marketed as AI as well, just the same kind of software that we had before. And I think this is often, often the case, and I will see some examples of that. But obviously, you know, if there weren't something that was called AI, uh, we wouldn't be marketing it as something different. So what, what is AI and how is it different from any other software technology and what got us to this place of, of marketing it um, in this kind of intense, intense way? So let's do a little brief digression into kind of giving a definition of AI and machine learning and some, some examples, getting into some specifics. And again, apologies uh, if this is um, kind of an overly simplistic overview for some of you uh, who may know more about this than me, but this is, as I did a bunch of research, um, I tried to come up with uh, some, some simple definitions here. Um, at a first glance, you know, you could give a definition of artificial intelligence as anything a computer does that seems smart, seems like, oh, that's the kind of thing that only an intelligent agent or only a person could previously have done. We could define artificial intelligence that way, but it's actually not a very helpful definition because computers were already doing things that seemed smart, even when we knew that there was nothing particularly in, you know, intelligent about them, even when we knew that it's just human beings writing a bunch of if-else statements um, and computers can perform tasks that used to require human intelligence, calculations, all kinds of uh, different uh, programmatic solutions to problems, things like that. So th this is a definition that I think ends up being what's actually used, um, but it's not a precise definition. It's not really helpful for us in determining whether uh, a given tool or product actually involves uh, AI or not. So, you know, we could also talk about machine learning, which tends to, I think, be susceptible to more specific and, and better definitions than AI does, which is this very generic term. So this this uh, 
person named Arthur Samuel once defined machine learning as the field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. And I think this is a much more interesting definition because it specifies uh, something that I think is, is intuitive and it puts it into words, this phrase, without being explicitly programmed and the phrase learn. I think this gets at um, kind of the, the core goal of machine learning and AI, which is uh, to have computers do things that are novel that we didn't explicitly instruct them how to do. So, you know, that's why the, the meme of the unmasking of the if else algorithms is funny because we, we naturally assume that when we talk about AI and machine learning, we are giving the computer uh, somehow the ability to do things that we're not telling it explicitly how to do, we're not teaching it explicitly how to do. So this definition of the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed I think gets at that very well. So what are ways that we could teach computers to learn without being explicitly programmed? Let's talk about a, a few of the kind of main subcategories of machine learning to give you some ideas about that. Um, there's a category of machine, machine learning that we call supervised learning, which basically just um, teaches a computer to learn a function. By function, I just mean given an input, what, what's the output that corresponds to that input based on a bunch of inputs that we already know the output to. Um, that's what we mean by tagged inputs there. There's something called unsupervised learning where instead of having a bunch of predetermined answers for the questions uh, in a data set that we want the machine learning model to, to learn, um, we give the machine learning process a bunch of kind of unclassified data and ask for it to figure out where the kind of natural differences are between uh, characteristics or attributes or qualities of that data so that it could potentially learn um, groupings of data without us explicitly giving it any examples of groups to begin with. There's something called reinforcement learning, which is a, a sort of different method of machine learning that can um, come up with similar results, um, but it's more it's more about giving a, a, a kind of scenario uh, that the machine learning model can act in. So give, give the machine learning model a kind of world um, that it lives in and give it the ability to do certain actions within that world and then have it take random actions in a sort of trial and error way, but reward some actions and some outcomes of those actions within the, the virtual world of the model more strongly than others uh, to kind of reinforce or teach the model what sorts of actions and outcomes um, lead to the situation that that we want in a very similar model as to how how actual you know human people learn and grow by you know as, as I've seen my toddler do trying random things and then seeing what happens and um, you know we we reinforce certain behaviors and things like that and that's how people learn to do things in the world so this is a similar way of, of trying to teach computers by constructing a world for them to, to act in. And then a, a sort of other category that people talk about, which isn't really a sort of different overall technique. Um, it's more of a, it's more of a different set of um, methods here is called deep learning. And again, it's not really its own category of machine learning. It's more of a specific take on the use of a particular uh, machine learning method uh, known as, as a neural network. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So what are some examples of, of these things? Uh, for supervised learning, we could use it to, let's say, classify a new instance of data based on uh, a model of data that's already existing. So we have a bunch of data points that we know are true, and then we could give the model a new, uh, a new input, and it would tell us what the, uh, the output is, whether that output is a category or a numeric value or something like that. Um, Example of what we might uh, use with unsupervised learning would be to find patterns in a data set that's a very big data set um, that has a lot of, of attributes and we're interested in finding natural groupings of that data, but it's hard to do that by hand. So we could um, feed all that into an unsupervised learning model and, and have it come back with us, come back to us and say, oh, here's uh, there are basically three types of data points and here they are um, in a categorized way. With reinforcement learning, we might 
uh, you know, enable a, a software program to develop human-like reasoning in some kind of task environment that's well-defined enough uh, for reinforcement learning to really work. And some of the use cases for deep learning would be to um, attack problems with input data that's so complex that traditional uh, methods, traditional neural networks might not be able to come up with a good answer for us. Um, some co more concrete examples, supervised learning, um, you know, th this is a, a kind of beginner's project with a lot of machine learning courses, you know, uh, create a model such that you get some information about a flower's characteristics and you use that to predict the species of a flower. With unsupervised learning, we could, you know, write a model that would take in a huge library of popular music. Uh, use it to find kind of natural groupings of songs based on, you know, characteristics that we might or might not think about. And then we could see whether those groupings of songs actually correspond maybe to what we consider uh, genre to be. And that would be an interesting project. Uh, with reinforcement learning, we could use it to teach a, you know, a bot to compete against humans in a video game, as has been done. Um, quite popularly with games like StarCraft or board games, things like that. An example of what we could do with deep learning would be maybe to classify the species of an animal just according to an image of an animal. And obviously an image of an animal doesn't, doesn't directly involve features of an animal. It directly involves features about pixel data and brightness and color and things like that. So to turn that into to a classification of an animal species is a really interesting complex problem that's um, suited for, for deep learning approaches. So um, just to put up some examples of some algorithms that are involved that you might hear about with some of these approaches. Um, with supervised learning, one of the simplest algorithms you might um, put into practice would be something called linear regression. Um, we've got things called, we've got clustering methods like k-means clustering. I'm going to kind of skip over this really quickly because I think it's I want to leave some good time for questions, and some of these I think are just a little, a little specific. Um, one of the more interesting things that you could look up if you haven't already is discussions about generative adversarial networks, which are kind of the the algorithms and ideas behind uh, you know deep fakes, which have been in the news quite a bit, and uh, which have real I think uh, consequences for how we're um, navigating different questions in society. But from a technical perspective, uh, basically the idea behind these generative adversarial networks, also called GANs, um, is that you don't have just one neural network that's constructing um, kind of fake data based on real inputs. Instead, you have two of them that work in a kind of imitation game against one another. So you get this sort of spiral of quality of the fake output that you're you're producing until at some point, the neural network that's producing fake output is producing fake output that's so good that the neural network that's responsible for deciding whether it's fake or not believes that it's true. And at that point, um, it's often high quality enough fake data that human beings struggle to um, tell whether it's fake or not as well. So some really interesting stuff here that you can certainly look into. Um, here's an example of what a linear regression model might look like, You know, taking a bunch of data points uh, in, in two dimensions here, we're, we're crossing income with years of post-secondary education and the dotted line that we're drawing is essentially the construction of a supervised learning model. So now that we have this line, which is nothing more than uh, a formula, we can, you know, take new values of income and predict new values of years of post-secondary education. So that's a kind of a very, very simple, um, but you know, oftentimes very successful machine learning method. Here's an example of what the stages of a, of a k-means clustering algorithm might look like, where you start out with these natural groupings of data and you want the computer to sort of figure out um, how to, how to um, separate them in such a way that given a new data point, you would know which cluster or which group it belonged to. So this is a kind of pictorial uh, representation of how that algorithm moves a kind of centers of gravity around so that it correctly um, sorts the various inputs and now can predict based on its final state uh, the categorization of new inputs that you might give to the system.
And here's an image that shows an example of a, a deep learning neural network in, uh, in process where you've got these um, multiple hidden layers uh, to the network that um, because of the, the, the different levels here can actually um, retain a lot of, of information from the, the training process. So you get a really surprising abilities to uh, give labels for things like animal species according to an input image. And this last picture here is an example of um, generative adversarial networks at work. So on the left-hand side, you've got uh, a bunch of output from the, the network. And on the right column of each of these are actual real um, instances of, of numbers or faces as the case might be. So those are actual pictures of faces or actual numbers that people drew. And all the other ones are um, kind of creations of the network. So you can see that for the most part, they could fool you into thinking that, you know, a real person might've have, might have drawn one of those numbers or, or, you know, the picture might be of a real person. You can also tell, especially with the pictures, there's some weird things going on and some of them don't seem quite real, but at a first glance they do. Okay. So given that kind of slight, slight deep, you know, slight dive, not deep dive, we'll call it a shallow dive into to AI and machine learning. Um, let's apply that kind of thinking to what we see in some of the, the marketing in the QA industry about machine learning. So I'm just going to go through a bunch of screenshots that I took of different tools and products in the uh, QA industry that promote AI in some way or another. Um, so this, this company is promoting something called visual AI. Um, they, they think that it provides something called intelligent testing um, using incredibly accurate visual AI. So that's interesting. Unsure exactly what that, what that means or what that could be. Um, here we have a company that's promoting codeless Selenium. Selenium is just a tool for automating web applications. So they're um, trying to convince us that we could have automated tests that we didn't have to write code for. Uh, using AI maintenance. It's a little bit unclear what AI maintenance means. Maybe they mean that rather than having to update tests ourselves when our app changes, maybe AI will somehow magically know how to update our tests to work with new versions of the app. A little bit unclear. Um, here we have a company that's promoting something called autonomous testing. Um, presumably, by autonomous testing, they mean testing processes that humans don't have to be involved in. Uh, so it appears to be different from automated testing because automated testing, humans are involved in the, the construction of the test themselves, even if they're not involved in manually walking through test steps. Um, they're claiming that their product removes something called test churn, increases accuracy and efficiency of testers, uh, you know, but without saying exactly how that happens, just that the AI is, is used in this process somehow. This company is a little bit more verbose um, in their description of how artificial intelligence is used in their product. They've defined certain levels, level zero to level five of automation, where um, levels three through five, they're saying, involve machine learning to some degree. This is kind of helpful because they're, I think, being a little bit more specific about the role of machine learning um, as it relates to their product. They're saying that level three involves human created scripts, but uh, machine learning involved to cause these scripts to be self-healing, whatever that means. Um, self-healing, I guess, meaning that if the script were to break, it would, it would be fixed automatically. Um, level four is, uh, has the subheading of near full automation, auto-generated smart scripts. So that sounds something like test scripts that aren't developed by people that are developed automatically by a machine learning model. Um, and then level five, which they call a game changer, involves 
mined off auto-generated smart scripts with validation. So a little unclear how this differs from level four and level five, I guess with level five, our minds can be completely off. Um, Sounds a little bit dangerous to me to turn your mind completely off, but there we have it. I guess with this company, we get level five autonomy, scriptless testing and so on. So interesting. If that, if that works, that could be, uh, that could be really interesting. This AI can generate real tests 100,000 times faster than humans. Wow. Okay, we have another screenshot. This company um, uses artificial intelligence to speed up the authoring, execution, and maintenance of automated tests. Okay, curious how that would work. And here's another company that, that um, gives app teams the power of AI. Okay, curious what, what power that would be um, exactly. I don't think of AI as a power so much as uh, a set of tools and practices. And finally, um, here's something that's a little more clear, at least in my mind. This company has these AI agents, apparently, that learns the Google News app on iOS. Oh, okay. So that seems like maybe we're, we're involved in some kind of reinforcement learning paradigm uh, where there's like a bot that's learning how to use an app um, on its own. So that, that's a thing that could happen, I suppose. And here's a, a screenshot of another application. It's actually uh, the Headspin product where you can see here, um, it's actually pretty difficult to see, but if I zoom in here, maybe I can't zoom in. Anyway, there's this um, little timeline element called video quality MOS that stands for mean opinion score. And you can see that there's this line that kind of goes up and down and that's sharing with us uh, the video quality in a video that's being played in an application uh, that was captured by Headspin. And um, I happen to know that this line is generated by a machine learning model that looks at the video and tries to determine the quality of the video without using any human input. So there's a the use of a, a machine learning model that um, has been trained on videos and uh, can determine the quality of a video now just by it being played on the screen of a mobile device, which obviously is a valuable thing. If your mobile app that you want to test uh, plays video and you want to figure out um, is the video being played at a reasonable level of quality or not. So that involves machine learning under the hood. That's a, that's a bit of a different, uh, different type of thing than, than we've seen so far. So, with all these examples, I think we can put together a few categories of what are called AI solutions in the QA industry. Um, there's one category that I basically would call AI and marketing only. Um, and as I've dug into some of these different products and looked at it, it appears that what's going on with, with a number of these is that uh, rather than the use of machine learning models in some cases, what we have is simply a bunch of intelligently designed software, you know, software that looks at inputs and using predetermined uh, flows or algorithms that were kind of coded by a developer somewhere uh, does something important and useful with an automated test script of some kind. So again, this kind of software would be uh, highly useful and worth paying money for, but uh, doesn't involve machine learning models. And so I, I would call kind of AI and marketing only, uh, maybe similarly to um, the toothbrush. Then I think there are some products that we can see that I would say use AI and machine learning in a supporting role where there are machine learning models that are involved and they're used to support uh, various aspects of the automated test process. Uh, they're not used as a replacement for actual human authoring of test scripts. So this would be something like the, um, uh, the self-healing scripts or scripts uh, or the video mean opinion score, things like that, where you have these machine learning models that give a kind of support to the, to the human test author so that they don't have to necessarily do as much work. Um, but there's still at the end of the day, a, a human being that's writing, writing test cases and, and uh, running them in an automated fashion to make sure that the app quality stays high. And then there's a kind of the third type of solution where you see that AI and machine learning is kind of the primary driver of automation. So uh, taking over the reins from the human test author and 
taking the responsibility of coming up with test cases and running through test cases on its own. In this case, uh, the main idea is that tests would be written and hopefully bugs found by autonomous bots that aren't kind of specifically directed by human beings. Um, and then they act on some kind of machine learning model that's already been trained on a bunch of applications and is then applied to your particular application and hopefully uh, responds or generates some kind of quality report for your application. Um, there are a few products out there that do this. And um, that's what I think we would call sort of real AI or a real use of machine learning models as the primary driver of automation. Um, so examples of each of these, uh, something, a product that would be AI and marketing only would be a, a product that, let's say, looks at user activity logs from your production application and uses those to generate test cases kind of with the insight that if you can uh, figure out what your users are trying to do in your application, and if you can record those user flows and user steps, you can turn those into test cases, test cases that can then be automatically run um, by automated tools in the future. And that will help prevent regressions for user flows that you know are actually in existence in your actual production application. Um, and that's something that you can do without using AI at all in the sense of machine learning models. It's something you can do simply by intelligently using software to scrape logs and generate uh, test automation code from those. Um, examples of, of something with um, AI and machine learning in a supporting role would be maybe image recognition models uh, used to detect visual differences between two instances of the same test case run at different times or run on uh, different devices or something like that. So it kind of gives you uh, a nice visual indication or warning about uh, potential issues with the visual display of your application screens in different environments. So using machine learning models to kind of detect the level of difference between two different screens. Or as I mentioned, the video quality models that give feedback on, on user perceived quality of a video that's playing on a screen. And in the last kind of level or category, um, an example would be a situation where you have your application that you've built, let's say it's a mobile app bundle and you send it off to this AI system and uh, its bots are turned loose on your app and it generates a kind of report uh, of screens that worked and screens that didn't and issues that it found. That would be kind of an example of a product that uses AI machine learning as the primary driver of automation. So uh, where are we at with our question that we asked? Is AI equivalent to BS in the test automation industry? Um, I would say more or less yes, if we just go by uh, where most of these products fall in the list of categories I said before, most of them tend to fall in the very top side of the list where it's kind of AI and marketing only, with a few exceptions. There are products out there that genuinely use uh, you know, robustly trained machine learning models, either as a support or in some cases as the primary driver of automation. And those are really interesting tools and products that I think we'll continue to develop and we'll continue to see and see more like that. But for now, I think most of what we see that talks about AI is kind of AI in, in marketing only in this particular industry. Um, but a follow-on question to this is, you know, do we actually need AI in our automated testing? You know, just because something is marketed to us as having AI in it, does that mean that we actually need it? Does that mean that it's actually any better? Um, my position tends to be that we should evaluate technologies based on whatever their actual return on investment is, whatever they actually propose that they can do for us, not whether or not they involve AI. So I think a lot of these tools that we saw screenshots of are, are genuinely useful things. Um, and the fact that they feel obliged to market themselves as involving AI is sort of unfortunate because it, in my mind, it takes away uh, in some ways from the actual value, actual ROI of the product where if they just told us specifically what they did and what they proposed to do for us, uh, even without the use of the word AI, I think it might be a little more clear um, whether there was something valuable there for us. And there is a lot of valuable software that doesn't involve, <laughs> doesn't involve AI at all. 
Um, so whether something involves AI or not is kind of irrelevant to us. Uh, what's relevant is just what can a particular technology do for us? Um, and we need to be skilled at evaluating that question, not evaluating how well something matches um, you know, a, a hype term. So, I mean, if you ever find yourself in the position, I suppose, of trying to evaluate some of these technologies that seem a little bit vaguely presented or just declare that they involve AI without any more specific details, obviously we could use our knowledge of, of AI and ask a kind of educated question like, oh, you propose that you propose to do this with your product, you know, did, you know, what corpus did you use to train your machine learning model on? And obviously if th the answer uh, comes back as, oh, we didn't, or, oh, we have no idea what we're talking about, probably, you know, they're not really using any interesting machine learning technology or uh, approaches under the hood. Um, and probably it's something more like AI in, in marketing only. So, you know, my, my prediction based on the products that I see right now is that most actual value that we're going to be getting from, from AI and machine learning in this industry is going to be the category of, of AI and machine learning in supporting roles, um, which I think it makes a lot of sense because um, for a while yet anyway, I think the, the technology is not quite there to take over the job of deciding what a good test case is, uh, deciding what user flows are, are important to automate and deciding what counts as a bug or what doesn't count as a bug, things like that. Um, but there's an awful lot of difficult problems uh, out there that I think machine learning could, could help with um, in a supporting type of role. And the examples that we gave of um, very uh, reliably telling us when two different test runs generate you know, visual screens that look different and that might be a problem or uh, the, the little feature of telling us, oh, you were running a test of this application and it played a video. And at this point in the video, the quality got really bad. Uh, that's a really interesting bit of information that gives us a lot of, of value. And um, that value comes from the, the value of the machine learning model that was trained on video to provide that kind of output. So that's kind of my thought about the state of AI and machine learning in the QA industry. Um, hope that was interesting. You know, granted, many of you may not be involved directly in the, the QA industry, but hopefully it, it was an interesting glance at what's going on in this particular world. And again, want to just share that uh, if you are interested in the QA industry, if you're interested in uh, learning more about test automation, maybe even learning how to write automated tests yourself, if that's something you're interested in as a potential career move. Um, that's kind of our job at Headspin University is to help people uh, go from, from not really knowing too much about automated testing and being to being proficient in it. So you could check us out at Headspin University. Uh, if, if you uh, want, you can also check out my blog and newsletter, appianpro.com, some interesting stuff there to do with, with mobile automation specifically. And um, just because I think it'd be fun to, to do this. Um, if anyone is actually interested in learning about mobile and web app automation, I just released a course called Appium and Selenium Fundamentals. Um, and I'm really excited about this course and really wanna get more people involved with it. Um, so if you email me at the, the email shown here, first five people to do that, I'll give you free access to this course and you can um, learn all about test automation, what is testing, web testing, mobile testing, how to build robust test suites, how to write code in the Python programming language. There's a whole bunch of stuff included in this course. So uh, yeah, first first five people that email me there, I'll give you free access to the course, uh, which is just coming out of beta at the moment. So that's it for me talking. Uh, I know that I've used up uh, probably more of the time than I intended to, but happy to stick around for a bit and answer some questions. So. Um, Sharon, if you've seen any interesting questions pop up or uh, however you want to arrange the Q&A time, let's do that. That was great. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, yeah, so we'll move into the Q&A session. We'll start with the ones that came in during the session. But if you have any other questions, uh, feel free to drop them in the chat below. So the first question is, sorry, I, I came late, uh, but I know you mentioned categories of AI solutions, but are there different categories of AI? Uh, also, what do deep fakes fall under? Right. So yeah. So deep fakes uh, might have missed this part, but um, deep fakes are a result of something called generative adversarial networks, uh, which is basically 
a, a very interesting technique involving the use of two neural networks to play a sort of game with each other where one, the job of one network is to produce um, novel items in, in according to whatever types of things it's been trained on. And the job of the other neural network is to uh, decide whether the item produced by the first network is real or fake. Um, and so obviously the, it starts out where everything that's being produced is gonna be very easily detectable as a fake. Um, but then the first model kind of learns from that and keeps making, uh, keeps trying new things until it gets better and better at producing fake, uh, uh, fake data until at some point the second model can't detect that it's fake anymore. And uh, we have a, a candidate that's then used. So, you know, when it comes to generating deep fakes of images or handwriting, like we saw, that's pretty straightforward. When it comes to, you know, video, um, I imagine that that what happens is, you know, you have a reference uh, reference actor, um, and then each frame of that is treated as a, an input image to the deep fake um, to the generative adversarial network, and and that results in like a new a new video. So, strikes me that that would take an awful lot of a processing time and and power. But I haven't dug into that specifically, so someone else might know more about that here. Fantastic. Okay. And the next question was, to what extent do you predict that AI will be replacing job ta jobs, tasks, or changing roles in the QA industry or other industries, or is this an overstated fear? Um, that's a good question. I mean, people, yeah, people land all over the board with answers to this question. Um, I haven't seen all that much that makes me think that that QA roles are going to be replaced anytime soon with completely autonomous, you know, AI driven bots. There are some interesting products out there that are aiming to do this and, you know, they're, they're making progress. And so we'll see how that goes. But I think the bar, you know, by far the biggest shift in the QA industry is going to, going to come just from automation. Um, there's still a lot of manual QA out there that's going to get replaced by automation. And obviously, uh, the fact of automation implies the reduction of of roles because one one person writing automation can you know right, accomplish more of more testing at the end of the day than uh, a number of people who are testing manually. Um, so that's going to be still, I think, for a while, the bigger type of change that we see. But then, yeah, down down the line, there may very well be uh, similar changes that occur as a result of of AI. Um, but I would say that typically what I've seen with AI is not that it completely replaces jobs, but that it turns the role of humans into something that's more like a training role or a guiding role or a labeling role rather than the role of actually driving things. Um, so we might just see a kind of shift of responsibilities there. It could come with a reduction in the number of roles that are available too. So, I mean, obviously, uh, whether or not you think AI is going to replace um, you know, automated testers, it's a good idea to familiarize yourself with AI because at, at some point um, you'll likely be using AI tools even if they're not completely replacing uh, testers as, as roles. Great. Um, and this was answered live in the Q&A, but I'm just gonna repeat it. Uh, if I've been in QA for a while, how can I contact you? Oh, well, I suppose it all depends on why you want to contact me. Um, but yeah, Shuchi put my email there. Um, depending on what your, your question is, I'm happy to help. So feel free to send me a note. Great. And yeah, um, how do you write automation to AI slash ML, which is black box and your expected results are just if statement? Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure what that question means. Um, Maybe answer it by saying there are you know different ways that machine learning can be involved in the the test automation process. Um, we have you know machine learning in a kind of supporting role. There are some products out that out there that, for example, you you write your test or you record your test using a a kind of test recorder, and then that test is run. And then um, if the test runs into problems, then there are mechanisms that try and and 
uh, fix those problems on the fly, either using actual machine learning or just using a bunch of if if else statements, right? So an example of the if else statement approach or just the algorithmic approach would be, let's say you've written a test that involves the use of a certain uh, element ID or selector and your test is in the process of running and uh, the test would fail because that element couldn't be found. Um, an algorithmic approach could could say, okay, well, last time we found this element, it could also have been found using a number of other selectors. So let's try some of those right now. Um, and if it can find the element by some of those other selectors, then the test proceeds uh, as planned. And maybe the code is even updated or the database is updated to prefer that new selector in the future. And that's often the kind of approach that's taken with test scripts that are called self-healing. Um, but then, yeah, it, in the other kind of category where machine learning is being used to drive the test in general, you don't you don't do anything to write automation. You just give it your app, and it it uses your app and generates a report for you about what worked and what didn't work. Uh, and you hope that it found everything that didn't work, and you hope that it understands your app well enough. Um, and that's kind of one of the, the areas of limitation right now, where I think that. Um, Oftentimes, an actual human being understands the the purpose and intent of the application in such a way that they're the only ones that are qualified to to say what counts as uh, appropriate behavior for the app and what counts as inappropriate or failed behavior or a bug. All right, and one last question: Have you seen a shift from DOM based automated test writing to visual component based automated test writing? Do you have a strong opinion on one versus the other? Yeah, I have seen more people that choose to sort of um, prefer visual tests over DOM-based tests or element hierarchy-based tests. Um, do I have a preference? I think it depends on how explicit you want to be and what you're testing. I think if you want to be really explicit about what you're testing, then the DOM-based approach is valuable and gives you if it fails, it gives you kind of a, a specific area to look for the problem. Um, I think the value of one of the value propositions of visual testing is that all you need to do is take a screenshot and then check for differences from something that you knew to be working well. And one one visual check can actually catch, you know, any number of bugs, right? So if you've got 15 elements on a screen that you would need to check sort of one after the other using a DOM-based approach. Uh, you could check all in one go using a visual approach. The only problem is if something fails, if there's a visual regression, you don't necessarily know what caused the failure. You have to go and look at it yourself. Whereas with the DOM-based approach, if something fails, you have the line of code right there that caused the failure and you know, oh, it was this particular element that that has the problem and you don't necessarily need to go and look at it. On the other hand, uh, if something fails, it's usually, usually involves a manual investigation anyway. So oftentimes just looking at an image of the screen and seeing what's been highlighted as a visual difference is enough for you to say, oh, I know where the problem is now. So yeah, pros and cons to both. To both. All right, looks like that's all the questions we have for today. Um, thank you for the questions. If you come up with the questions later on, feel free to reach out to any of us afterwards. And I just want to thank everyone for joining. There will be a recording that we will send out and that will also be available on both husband.io and woman, womaninbigdata.org. And special thanks to Jonathan, again, for providing us with this great uh, presentation discussion. Um, thank you. Have a great rest of the day, yeah. everyone. Welcome. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.